All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Jed Morley, who is in Salt Lake City in Utah. How are you doing, Jed? Doing great. Thanks, John. Excellent, excellent. And uh, and Jed is um, is a brand strategist and a CMO for hire, backstory branding. And what we're going to talk about today is uh, aligning your brand messaging to increase sales and retention. So, um, so let's get let's get straight into it, Jed. Sometimes, sometimes a lot of salespeople say, or people who are more sales oriented, don't get the connection between um, the branding messaging and sales and retention. Like they think that they're kind of two separate things. They think that that's very, you know, way top of the funnel stuff and doesn't really affect them. The insights that my clients and I have aligned around is to think about the entire customer journey. So if we can promise something in marketing that the product actually delivers and the sales team can make a a recommendation of the right product fit for each customer and have that customer realized the value that they were promised, the possibility of them actually being delighted by that product and being retained and loyal to the brand and the business is a lot higher. So what the process is that I've come to believe and recommend is that we create ideal customer profiles and personas that everybody contributes to so that there's a a shared sense of ownership and understanding about who are our customers, what do they want, what's in their way, so that we're fulfilling on expectations. And that's really the name of the game is living up to the brand promise. In that sense, everybody's got to be a brand steward because if we promise something we can't fulfill, if the experience is different than what was expected, then customers drop out, they don't renew, they don't retain, and then everyone's the worst for it. Yeah, um, I think there's a couple of points there that I just wanted to pick up on. Um, the first one being the most fundamental one, as you said, is the brand is a totality of the experience somebody has from the moment they come in contact with your with your brand to through the sales process, through becoming a customer, onboarding and all of that, and then, you know, how they're supported, et cetera, after that. And I think that's the thing that 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 it's maybe people need to get their head around is that whole concept that it is the brand is the totality of the experience. It's not a logo, that's for sure. You're exactly right. When we think about a successful brand, it's the sum total of all of the touch points. It's everything that comes in contact with us as customers. And we look at great brands like Nike, Southwest, Apple. It's easy to notice and recognize a great brand when we experience one, but then it's our turn to design one intentionally. And it's difficult to remember that it's the holistic experience because we're all self-interested. So if we can step back and look at what we can contribute and how we can partner, ultimately our goal is to have a brand that leads the category that's dominant in its space. And that's a team sport. Yeah. And if you think about it, I mean, some of the drawbacks are if you don't have that, uh, if you don't have that um, shared brand uh, uh, custodians, like if everybody is in the custodian of the brand, um, what you get is, yeah, you come up with the brand and the messaging and all of that, but then salespeople interpret it differently. So, you, you know, you're getting, you're getting a perception of the brand it's different depending on who you talk to. And that's not what you want. You're right. To me, it reminds me of a Rubik's cube. You have all of the squares of a Rubik's cube scrambled. You're sending mixed messages. The goal is to create alignment so that when you're talking to a green oriented audience, everything you say reflects a green reality. You're offering that part of your value proposition that resonates with that audience and getting clear about what each side of your story communicates and then adapting the story specific to each audience is when you set up sales for success. And go back to an earlier point you made as well is about the fact that people, you know, all the different constituencies need to be involved in this process. Um, talk to me a little bit about that when you do that work with, with your clients. How do you get like marketing, sales, customer? How do you get everybody to be aligned around the personas? We get in a room together and work through it. We discuss, debate and go so far as to interview customers who've been selected by the sales team as being representative of the kinds of companies they would love to clone, that they would like to have more 
relationships with because they're profitable, because they get a lot of value out of the offering. When we sit down together to discuss and decide who exactly our best customers are, what their shared characteristics would be, it's interesting to see the light go on in marketing's eyes and sales eyes and to realize that everybody had part of the puzzle pieces. And when we combine them together, it creates a complete picture. So it's unlikely that any one group, any one department or functional area is going to have the complete picture on their mm -hmm. own. We're interdependent. We need to create a shared composite sketch so that we get the picture and the story right. And let's face it, there's a lot of onus on, on marketing, isn't there? Because I mean, when you bring in other departments into, into a process like this, it's very easy for marketing to get all jargony and to get all kind of puffing out their chest and all of that. And that really switches people off because they're like, oh, that's all that's a marketing mumbo jumbo that they talk about. So there's an onus on marketing to really bring people into this process and make them comfortable in it. That's right. We've got to keep it real. I like what Jeffrey Moore says about customer segments. A segment is a group of people who buy for the same reason. According mm -hmm. to Jeffrey Moore, he's the author of Crossing the Chasm. Yeah. He, he then go, takes it a step further. People who buy for the same reason and who talk to one another. And the goal is to understand why these people buy and to be able to describe the pain, the problems in their own words, in their own language. Who talks to customers more than sales? Nobody. So it's really important to channel the customer insights through the lens of sales and to understand what the customers are saying about the problems they have so that marketing can reflect those problems in the language of the customer and be that much more relevant to them. Yeah. And let's face it then, I mean, people like customer support, customer success or whatever, they end up uncovering things that nobody did because sometimes even during the sales process, I would say to you, Jed, like, oh, this is the issue I'm having and this is the one I want to solve. I buy the product or service from you. And then I discover that I'm using it slightly differently because then actually it helps me over here with something. And, and maybe I have to talk to customer support and my customer success person to discuss it. But that's really invaluable information for, for the marketing and sales teams as well. That's right. In a perfect world, we would be circling back and finding out from customer support and client success, what are you hearing? And folding that back into the master messaging framework so that everybody is using the most complete version of the customer profile, the customer pain points, the value propositions that resonate. In that way, messaging is really relatively dynamic. It's never truly finished. It's ongoing. I think it is like the Golden Gate Bridge. It's never finished being painted. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, I mean, the circling backwards, to be honest, most companies are just running around in circles, really. But um, uh, yeah, it's a great it, it's a great point. And I think that's another point. And this is true of, of, of sales and marketing is sometimes and I think it's a human nature thing is sometimes we want to feel like things are finished. Right. Oh, we finished our messaging. We finished our branding. It's like, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, in, in sales as well. Yeah. You know, we've done our strategy, whatever. Or we have our sales process. We have, you know, we did. And but to your point is all of these things are dynamic and they're getting more dynamic. They're not getting less dynamic. They're getting more dynamic. So you have to be constantly looking at and tweaking and, you know, continuous improvement, basically. That's right. And the goal really is to be a learning organization and to always have our antenna up for a new opportunity to be more on point more of the time. So we like to teach our clients that it's a collaborative effort. It's an ongoing process. There should be continual updates. We should revisit our messaging on a regular basis so that we're not static, so that we're not um, falling behind the competitive front. And those inputs that come from competitors push us to be our best, not to mention our own release schedule. So there's really no opportunity to coast in today's a digital marketing environment. Are there, are there trends that you have noticed maybe over the last while, Jed, of elements that are elements that are more important than maybe they used to be in, in messaging and in branding? Are there new elements coming in or are becoming more important than perhaps they were before? And maybe other elements becoming less important? I wonder about analyst relations. It used to be that if you got in the magic quadrant, that was kind of like your ticket to success and you could coast. 
or at least draft off of that pronouncement. Anymore, I feel like the perceptions that matter the most are the ones that customers have because they're consuming information as fast as the analysts are, and they're having to make practical sense out of it. So it goes from the theoretical to the pragmatic really quickly. And if something doesn't work as promised, if there's a new way of doing something, chances are customers are going to know about it before the analysts do. So I wonder if the analyst relations aspect is becoming less of a factor in the selling and buying process. Obviously, if you're an enterprise-sized company, you're going to be really careful because there's so, so much riding on those decisions. It can be really difficult to change software systems once you've selected and implemented something. But for small and mid-sized companies, I feel like they're defining the category faster than the analysts can. The analysts are more about reporting what they're hearing and less defining it than they might have been in the past. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's an extremely important point that you made there because I I totally agree with you. I think on I think there was a time when the you know the analysts had their place and you know they have a role to a degree, but I think unfortunately nowadays to your point is is they're not practitioners anymore. They're not in in the, they're not they're not feeling the pains of of the ever changing business environment. So yes, they get very theoretical or they focus in on trying to be futurists and coming up with all sorts of stuff that to be honest, nobody needs, nobody wants, nobody cares about, but it all sounds right. And I think we all want to have our egos stroked and to get an award, but the award doesn't mean mm -hmm. much. Nobody else is aware of it or values it. Yeah, so absolutely. You, can get, you can get a trophy, but if it's not aligned with what customers really want, what does it matter? Yeah. And let's face it. I mean, there's a huge amount of skepticism out there whenever people get awards or get featured on something there. Us being us as human nature, being the cynics and skeptics that we are, we go, yeah, probably, probably paid a lot of money to be there. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I think that's one thing. I, I agree with you. I think the voice of the customer, the experience of the customer, the customer testimonials, all of that stuff, uh, I think is is so much more important. I think that's what really starts to bring bring things alive is that human element. And I think that's, again, where maybe the division between, you know, we had analyst relations of old and new is that one thing about analysts is they certainly don't come across human right it's not a very humanized um ex experience for for the, the the researcher but customer stories video testimony stuff like that like the, that the real customer stuff that's what people really crave because that gives them a much greater sense of comfort it does you know i worked for a company called ideo earlier in my career and they talk about human-centered design and mm -hmm. they've been advocates for design thinking where you understand by observation and empathy, what someone's going through, look at the world through their eyes, walk in their shoes. Empathy is really the difference maker. And then being able to translate the insights that come out of empathy into customer centric design so that you're solving problems in a way that's relevant to people. And then celebrating the customer as the hero of the story rather than making it all about you and your product. Doing that operationally at scale gets challenging if there isn't a shared understanding of the customer. So I see marketing's role as being the repository of the single source of truth, but it's really a collective effort to give the inputs into that shared profile that creates a definition that everybody can get behind because they contributed to it and there's a shared sense of buy-in. Yeah, no, I, I I totally agree with that. I think that's absolutely absolutely critical, and and I do think, and I'm, I would ask you this as a as a as a marketing expert, how much is the humanizing of brands becoming important? I think it's huge, and I think it's because brands have to be transparent. People want to connect; they want to feel like they're in a relationship with a brand. So, whatever you can do to create that sense of connection is going to separate you from the sterile brands, the brands that feel like they're automatrons, they're robotic, they're mechanical. There's a tendency to try to automate everything. And I think high touch is really important to retain some access to real people. I worked for a software company, Bamboo HR, and they're in the HR space. And so they were more people centric and oriented than might have been the case otherwise. But the key to their mm -hmm. success has been to live their own brand culture. So they espouse this idea of setting people free to do great work. I helped them articulate that purpose statement. That was eight years ago. If they hadn't been living their brand, it would have been really hard, I think, for their people to 
be compelling and authentic and convincing when they talk about the impact that their software has. So it's important that we live the brand internally, culturally, and have a human connection to our employees and ultimately to our customers if we want them to feel a sense of connection to us. And I think that's the biggest strategic advantage is if you create a relationship with your customers, that's really hard to undo. Yeah, yeah, it's like turning, you know, customers into fans, isn't it, at the end of the day, or advocates is where you want them to be. Um, but interestingly, though, is I, I think the pandemic, I think it was happening before the pandemic, but I think the pandemic absolutely accelerated people's um, you know, need for that human element, that connection with the brand, like dealing with real people. And because I, I just think that's all come into sharp focus. And because we even pre pandemic, remember, to, to your point about automation, we went through this horrible period of where it seemed like a lot of big brands were doing everything they could to make sure you never, ever get to talk to a human. It's so true. And, and there again, we think about the brands that mean the most to us. And it's because we had a conversation with someone who made us feel like they cared. Yeah, there was yeah. some kind of a, an extra effort to show appreciation for our time and money. And it's those connections that create stories that are worth retelling. And that all starts with culture. And that's why we're so intentional mm -hmm. in backstory about the internal brand story and the external brand story, aligning the two so that you actually can make and keep a meaningful promise. Yeah, and it's not like it's not like we don't have enough ex uh, examples of experiences in our own lives about you know poor brand uh, poor brand experiences, poor customer service experiences, whatever. But sometimes we 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 have this strange amnesia when we cross the threshold of our own work, then we forget about all those, and we create just the same crappy experiences for our customers. Yeah, it's really weird when we can celebrate and read the books and look at all the case studies, but then when it's our turn to do it, somehow we forget what it's like mm -hmm. to be a customer. I think one of the best things we can do is continually be talking to customers. So many times when I have the opportunity to represent a brand and do in-depth interviews and uncover the way the customer perceives the brand and the people who deliver the brand's services, there are these wonderful insights and details and stories that come out of those conversations. And I wonder sometimes why the client company isn't doing that for themselves? Why do they outsource that to me? I'm obviously a, a professional and I have a proven process, but wouldn't it be great if that were more of a standard practice than a special project? Yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I took over a company once uh, many years ago now, and one of the first things I did you know, when you when you come in as the new CEO, it's like, yeah, set me up with some customers and I'll go visit them and have a chat and all of that. And it was really interesting because I went to the customers and they were all very consistent. They all loved the products and services, loved, you know, raved about it. The people, fantastic, all of this stuff. But they all said, but you know, you're difficult to do business with. I mean, even if we want to do more business with you, like, you know, you're just difficult to do business with. And nobody had heard that before. And, uh, and everybody was sort of sitting on their laurels because everybody loves what we do. But nobody had invested to your point. So our brand was great product, terrible company to try and do business with. <laughs> think about the opportunities that opens up mm -hmm. it probably wasn't that expensive to remedy some of the problems that people were having and no and you know what it wasn't expensive at all because it was a priority and focus thing that's all at the end of the day it was awareness to begin with we it's, i mean the first part of anything is awareness you can okay um we're difficult to do business with well i don't think we are but i'm sorry our customers do and their their opinion counts more than yours so Exactly. Let's get going, dig it, dig into it. But yeah, it was, it was like I said, it actually wasn't an expensive or time consuming process at all, because once you become aware of something, you can, you can fix it. And then it becomes sort of embedded in your DNA because you're always wondering, Ooh, is that going to make us difficult to do business with? <laughs> I really think it comes down to a commitment to doing great work. And it sounds like that's yeah. what you did at your company, John, as you were focused on what can we do to elevate this and take it to an even higher level. And it's so easy to get complacent. I guess that's really the key is to never be content and to always be striving for doing something better, finding ways to add more value. Yeah, I know. And that, I think that's another fantastic point you raised there is that thing about complacency and making assumptions. I think those are the two worst things you can do nowadays, particularly, is uh, complacency. Everything is moving so fast and making assumptions. And we're really good at that because sometimes, you know, you, I'm sure you have this, you'll ask one of your clients, so. Oh, 
when was the last time you know you you revisited your 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 buyers and their buying process and all of that and they'll say oh yeah no we're up on that that's fine when did you do it like three years ago okay exactly yeah and i think there's opportunity for everybody in the company to be aware of opportunities to share insights and if there's a way to collect that feedback and know that it's going to get actioned and that it will be considered i think makes people want to be aware and to share yeah no absolutely listen uh, jed this has been great uh, great great insights here about uh, about brand and how brand impacts sales and retention and how it's a shared collective experience and how it's the totality of the experience of your your customers all of jed's information is going to be below this video but before we go please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and backstory branding thanks john so backstory branding helps ceos scale by getting their story straight we believe that if you don't have a, a clear concise consistent story you can't scale your success we've worked with leaders in a variety of categories from purple mattresses to lucid chart to bamboo hr and we pride ourselves in understanding why people buy so we really unpack the insights, layers of meaning so that you can connect with your customers and surprise and delight them on a consistent, scalable basis. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I would encourage you to go check out uh, Jed and Backstory Brand. You do some great, uh, great uh, brands that you're working with there and well-known ones too. So excellent. I think you should go check out Jed's work. Um, thanks again, Jed. Uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop, Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another interview real soon.